welcome to MCTV's Let's Talk. I'm Mike Stanzillis, Vice President of Membership and Government Affairs for the Morris County Chamber of Commerce. And today we're continuing our series on leadership. And we are truly blessed to have one of the region's great leaders, Dennis Wilson, the President and CEO of Delta Dental of New Jersey and Connecticut. Dennis joined Delta Dental back in September of 2013 as the President and CEO. And by the way, Delta Dental is a huge supporter of the Chamber of Commerce, and we really thank them for that. In fact, uh, Dennis was recognized by the Chamber for his outstanding contributions to our community, and he received the William P. Huber Award for Outstanding Community Leadership. And this award is presented to individuals who exemplify exemplary exceptional leadership with the hopes to inspire others to undertake challenges to help improve the lives of Morris County area residents. And today we're going to talk with Dennis about none other than leadership. So Dennis, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Mike. And it's a pleasure to be here. And also, it's, it's great to be a partner with the Morris County Chamber. It's been a, a, a terrific experience for me personally, the company, and, you know, the greater business community. So um, I'm excited to be here. Well, we're really excited to have you. And, and Delta Dental, not just partners with the Chamber, but Delta Dental partners with a lot of organizations around the region. And one of them is the New Jersey Devils. I'm a Devils fan. I've been to lots of games, and I see the, the skaters out there with the Devils, I mean, with the Delta Dental shirts and the shovels. But that Zamboni that goes around the ice, they call it the Fan Zam. Dennis, Randy Soddard, your director of marketing, burst my bubble one day and he said, you know, Mike, that Fan Zam doesn't clean the ice. It just drives around. So I was like, oh, you're kidding me. I wish you would have never told me. But Dennis, have you ever been for a ride on the Fan Zam? Uh, many, many rides, Mike, on the Fan Zam. And I, and I have to tell you, even though it does not clean the ice, People love to get on it and fire off T-shirts and wave to the, the folks in the arena and, and just have a, have a great time. And the Devils have been awesome partners with us. Big, big shout out to them, what they do for and with us. Yeah, the Devils is a great organization. They're also members of the Morris County Chamber of Commerce. But, you know, I thought it's genius marketing that you guys are doing with the Devils. So uh, great job there. So let's just jump right into it. We're talking about leadership today. A lot of people aspire to that corner office where you're sitting, you know, the CEO, some kind of a leadership or management position. What was your career path like, you know, becoming a CEO and how did you get to where you are now? Thanks for the question, Mike. And I have to tell you, I had I think an atypical uh, path to that to that corner office. I had some success very, very early in my career, but it wasn't traditional. It wasn't like get your undergraduate degree, go get your MBA, and go through a management training program, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the book as it was written in that regard really was not the track I, I, I took. Uh, I, I graduated from the University of Massachusetts came out of school uh, in, in, in the great state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Mass, uh, at a time when there was a 12% unemployment rate. And by, I aspired to go into marketing and what marketing meant was advertising, branding, all of the traditional things that you think about in terms of marketing. But those jobs were few and far in between. So like a lot of marketing majors, I went into sales and, and I did well at it. It was with a great company, uh, was with the New England Mutual, uh, very good, solid uh, basis for the rest of my, my career. I was successful, um, went into management um, at a very early age. Uh, literally, I was uh, almost just one year with the, with the company. Um, and then took my career in a very unusual uh, uh, direction. I wanted bigger, better, um, more, more scope, more national in perspective and, and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I took the unusual track of leaving an organization that I was highly successful in only after uh, a few years with that organization and took some risk personal and otherwise, and worked for an organization that was owned by a private equity firm, uh, went in there as a, as a senior leader, 
Um, and one thing led to another, a transaction was looming on the horizon as it always does in the private equity world. Um, and I was named as CEO at the age of 29. So I kind of leapfrogged through some, I thought, intelligence, maybe at the time I thought reckless, uh, but you know, I was in my 20s, I could afford to take risk. My wife was solidly behind me. Um, everything was, was pointing to the direction and if it didn't go right, so what? Pivot, go to something else and start again. So my career in employee benefits, healthcare in general really started there. And, and my corner office experience started at the age of 29. Wow, that's an incredible story and it's really inspirational. But what I really like is you talked about risk quite a couple of times there and you took that risk. So what advice would you give to someone who was, wants to be on a career path, you know, towards that corner office or some sort of leadership or management role? Uh, you know, talk to them about the risk and, 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 and managing that or taking the risks uh, and how would they get to that ultimate goal? So risk in general, right? Uh, I encourage my senior leadership team to take intelligent risks and the two words must go together. They have to be calculated, researched, and, and quite frankly, framed in a way that would allow the organization and the individual to recover if in fact that risk went sideways, uh, if in fact, call it failure occurred. And, you know, the jump off to a, a related point about risk and failure, um, my view is, is, is failure should be not only tolerated, but uh, in a way celebrated because you learn from things that go wrong. You learn from miscalculations and you build a stronger self and a stronger company by failing, but failing quick, recovering, learning, and taking a different path. Incredible, you know, you're embracing failure. So let's stay with failure for a second because you, you really mentioned that word quite a few times. You know, you tolerated it and you celebrated it, right? What, what are some of the things that you've learned in your life from some failures that you may have experienced as a leader that you can teach the rest of us? So I, I won't be specific in terms of the, the, the name of the company or, mm -hmm. or, or anything like that, but I'll, I'll point to a recent one that uh, happened uh, during my tenure at Delta Dental. And, uh, and, and briefly to describe it, it was uh, a different line of business. It was a departure from um, our core, uh, from our base but it was uh, what we thought an intelligent, supportive departure. And all of the analytics were, were completed. There was a partnership formed with another sister Delta. Um, resources were decked up uh, to make this as successful as possible. Um, and at the end of it, it just didn't work. Uh, the revenue model was off. There are some other things that just were not calculated correctly. So the subsidiary failed, but the people didn't. What we did is we learned a significant amount about that particular space of our business that we'll only use as a platform for future success. So while it failed, quote unquote, it succeeded because we were so um, plentiful relative to the receipt of learnings, a better way to do things, a way to tweak the model and a way to make it better. Yeah, it's a great answer. And clearly, you know, celebrating and tolerating is not beating people up for failing because then they'll never take a risk ever again. So a key piece of a successful leader like yourself is building great teams, right? What's important for you when, when building a team, but also leading that team? That's a great question, Mike. And, and I've really learned uh, 
early in my career to do a couple of things. Surround yourself with the best team possible. And I'll use a, a bit of a sports analogy if you'll, if you'll let me, right? I, I believe in hiring great athletes versus great position players. Although at times a position player is necessary. For example, you need someone extraordinarily competent in certain aspects of technology, let's say. But broad leadership skills, a broad base of experience, both from within and outside your industry is a great formula for a successful team. So hire the best team possible. Surround yourself with people that know a whole lot more in areas than you do, mm -hmm. right? That's number one. And number two, let them do their jobs. Give them the latitude, the space, the support. Set the bar high for yourself. Set the bar high for them. And whatever you do, don't micromanage a great leader and a great player. It's the quickest way to drive them out of the organization. So get good people with good skill sets, diversified backgrounds, diversity of thought and experience, and let them do their job. You know, there's one word that comes to my mind in, in, in what you were just talking about, and that's trust. So I think in your case, you must have to have that incredible sense of confidence to trust them, to let them go, right? At the, abs absolutely. And, and, you know, trust uh, is like loyalty is, is absolutely a two-way street, mm -hmm. right? So, so they have to have the confidence and trust in you to have open conversations with, quite frankly, healthy pushback uh, and, and differences of opinion brought to the table and you them as well. All right, great, pushback. Let's talk about that. We've all been at meetings where there's two different kinds of people. There's the bobbleheads, yes, sir, yes, 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 agreeing with everything you say. They call them yes men. Um, or there's that contradictory person who's, we've always done it this way, we can't do that, we can't do this, and we can't do that. And there's the right amount of pushback to the boss. H how do you define with your team how much pushback you like and, 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 and the pushback that you need so that you're not getting yes to death. So assuming you have the, the, the right people in place, the great leaders that I, that I just described, you, I, I expect them to come to the table with a, with a different point of view, with a different perspective. So call it differences in point of view and perspective pushback. Mm -hmm. um, that's okay. Um, I also think that the right to push back um, and the right to have that difference of opinion is earned, right? It's, it's, not, it's not entitled just because you have a large title or because you're chief of whatever. Um, that, that right to push back and have a, I'll call it a spirited dialogue with the CEO as well as the other teammates is earned. And it's earned by past success and it's earned by credibility and it's earned by transparency. You know, one of the, I think, best business movies that I think I've ever seen from a business leadership perspective is Ford versus Ferrari, right? Matt Damon, Christian Bale. And if anybody that's ever seen the movie, and I encourage everyone to do so, particularly from a leadership and business perspective, was Ford got walloped in the 24 hours of Le Mans by Ferrari, right? The, the, the nemesis, the, the holder of uh, the Le Mans uh, trophy for years and years and years. So Matt Damon playing... Um, Carol Shelby pushed back significantly on Henry Ford II when Henry Ford II called him into his office and basically was up one side of him, down, down the other. Now, Matt Damon came, Carol Shelby came to that table with credibility. He himself had raced and, in, and won at Le Mans, right? 
he himself was building a world-class automobile. And his answer to Henry Ford II, if anybody recalls the movie, was we got him right where we want him. <laughs> so you recall the year after, in 1966, one first, second, third, fourth place was Ford, 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 and Ford. So that, credibi that credibility, that, that ability to push back, that knowing, having the ultimate confidence in, in what you bring to the table is just brought out by that example that I just gave you. That is a, a, an amazing example. And also, I'll, I'll go car geek on you for a second because you went there. Yeah. You know, when, they, when the Shelby Mustangs came out, it was a revolution. My favorite car, the 69 Shelby GT 500 Mustang, uh, it's just unreal. And, and so I could, we could go on a car show for a few minutes, but we'll go back to leadership. But that is a great <laughs> story. We could talk movies, cars. But um, let me go back to something you said earlier. 29 years old, you become the CEO of this company. What would you tell now, with all the experience you've had throughout your entire career, what would you tell the 29-year-old Dennis Wilson? What advice would you give yourself that many years ago? So the, and we've all heard this, if you want to do, if you want to get something done right, do it yourself. I would take that advice and put it in the closet and never have it seen the, see the light of day, right? Because leadership is, is getting excellence and a great product and a great results through the efforts of not only yourself, but others through the team. So the biggest piece of advice was, would be let it go. Do what you do the best. Let your other leaders in the organization do what they do best and collectively march past the goal. That's what, I, that, that's what my advice would be because we all have a tendency, particularly newer in a position, maybe a little less experienced to, to get our hands around everything, you know, open every cover, look in every crevice. And if you will, micromanage the thing to uh, a, a slow death. Mm -hmm. um, just don't do that. Let it go. Let folks do their job. And as long as you've got that team around you, you will be successful. Yeah, that's such great advice. We, we've often seen the person who is the great getter done person, the person who's the doer, the task, the task manager, the task accomplisher, doing such a great job, get promoted into leadership, can't let go of being the task person. And that's really great advice. You hit it right on the head. So we're gonna close out with a fun question that I always ask our CEOs and leaders. And that is, what would you tell a 12 year old how, what your job is in two or three sentences? How would you describe your job to a 12 or 13 year old in two or three sentences, Dennis? So I would say, what, what does it mean? What does it mean to be the boss? What does it mean to be the, the, the CEO, right? It means that the buck stops at your desk, meaning that just because you're the boss, you're the CEO, you're really not the boss because you answer, you're always answering to someone else. Number one, you answer to your, to your customers. Number two, you answer to the board of directors. Three, you answer to the leadership team that you have. And as important as all of those uh, that I just mentioned, you answer to your associates and employees. You are responsible for their success, for their well being, and particularly these days, their health and safety. It's a great answer you just defined a servant leader. So Dennis, I really want to thank you so much for being here and, and the support of Delta Dental for the Morris County Chamber of Commerce. Thanks to Dennis Wilson, President and CEO of Delta Dental of New Jersey and Connecticut. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, Mike. And thank you to all of our great Chamber of Commerce members. We really appreciate your support. Thank you.